No chance. Alright, um, we might as well get started. We're waiting for OJ, but he'll come up soon. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I've co-opted first talk because I've got to take off early tonight. Um, so thanks, Brian. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to actors in Scarlet Z. Um, I think we've had talks on Scarlet Z before. Yeah, Nick did one a while back. Um, so I'm not going to go into Scarlet Z, and it's not really Scarlet Z specific, it's just Scarlet Z's implementation of actors, which is about 15 lines of code, but anyway, you'll get the drift. And if we have time, I'll go through a demo, um, but yeah. I'm not going to talk about really any problems with threading or anything like that. I've got one slide on that, but I'm going to whip through that and hopefully get into some code and see how we go. Okay, so here's my one slide on threading. So how you've probably done threading before is manual creation of threads, manual synchronization, um, one thread per process, that's not really true. Anyway, um, obviously copied and pasted some of this code. Uh, mainly you're dealing with threading with shared state and trying to um, trying to synchronise shared memory between things and you know with mutable data structures and it just yeah, it all blows up in your face. So some of the problems with threading, two slides. Um, threads don't compose very easily. Um, they're expensive to create in some OSs. They're a bit too low level, like nobody really kind of wants to deal with them. They're very hard to get right unless you're really good at it and even if you're really good at it, they're very hard to get right. Um, they can be too complicated, prone to errors, um, and something I stole off Aruna, who I stole a lot of these slides off, who wrote a better talk than me. Um, newer APIs like java.utilock and current.future don't compose well without blocking threads. So there's kind of... Scala Z is based on Scala, which is based on the JVM, so there's a lot of Java-specific stuff in the library, or it delegates a lot of Java stuff as well. So I'm kind of coming from that angle as well. <coughs> Apologies if no one knows Java. I'm not going to delve into Java things, but basically there's old threading code with primitives built into the language and then there's newer stuff that's all API driven and that's what this util lock and current package is and it gives you newer primitives like locking locks and things like that. Okay, so that's that's it. So what's an actor? Um, so this I think I stole this off Wikipedia. A lightweight thread like process that communicates by asynchronous messaging. So it's kinda of like a thread but it's not really. It may run in a thread, it may not. Um, it's basically just a bit of code that runs and you send messages to it and that's really it. Now there are some rules about actors, and again this is stuff that I stole off Wikipedia. Um, everything is an actor. Actors have addresses that you send messages to, and in response to a message an actor can only send messages to other actors, so it needs to know about those other actors, so it needs to get their addresses from somewhere. Um, create a finite number of new actors, um, and also control how it handles those messages that are coming off its queue. So pragmatically what that means is really you've got in my head anyway, you've got two rules, and that's an actor has a mailbox that it receives messages on and it processes them, and actors communicate only using messages, so there's nothing else. You don't have anything to go on, you don't share any data. If you're sharing data, you're passing it the data that you want it to work with, and if that's immutable, then you're in a much better position. So yeah, so assume processes says actors here. So actors receive messages on some queue, um, messages are enqueued onto that queue with no waiting, so it's a non-blocking call, it just whacks it on and then you keep going. Um, an actor is always either suspended or it's working on a message. Um, and an actor can process messages in some order, but that order is not defined, so it doesn't need to process them in the order that they come in on. There's apparently there's literature about why that's good or bad. I'm not going to delve into that. Okay, so that's brief two-minute summary of Scarlet Z actors. Uh, Scala actors, sorry. So Scala Z actors are not Scala actors. They're a complete rewrite. Um, they, I suppose they share some of the concepts, but that's about it. So they're much, much, much simpler, I think. I haven't done a lot with Scala actors, mind you, but the Scala Z ones are really, really easy to get them running. They're pretty trivial. The messages are typed uh, with the Scala Z actors, and they're not with the default Scala actors. There are other actor implementations in Scala. There's one in Lyft, which is a popular web framework. There's one in Acker which is a popular, I don't know, do-everything framework. Um, I'm not 100% I'm not sure what it does. When it started, it was kind of this big save-the-world framework, and now it seems to have grown into something a bit better. Um, the actor trait in Scala Z is sealed, which means you can't extend it, so you can't subclass it. So you need to pass your function to a method that gives you back um, the actor. So it's kind of hard to get your head around what it's actually doing. Like, you're not subclassing thread like you would in Java. Um, or implementing a runnable interface or whatever you do in other languages. You're kind of 
it's it's sealed. You can't do anything with it. That's it. But it's very very easy and flexible to work with. So basically, you instanti instantiate an actor by supplying the type that the actor works on. So there's one type. So this is A in this, and you'll see A throughout these slides. You give it an effect. So it's a side effecting function that returns unit. So unit is void in JavaScript. Or basically, it returns nothing. So you give it something to work on, and then it returns you nothing. So it does all its work. So that's all it can do. It takes, now if you know Scala, you'll know what that implicit keyword means. It takes an implicit strategy. So the strategy I'll talk about in a sec, but it's basically how the actor does its work, or how, how the actor runs. And you can optionally give it an error handler. And if you don't, it just throws stuff, just rethrows the exception. So you can give it an error handle if you want to handle that. And that leads to some interesting possibilities. Or you can just do stuff like I did in my example, like lock the error and keep trucking along. Okay, so this is all the Scala Z actor is. Strategy plus the effect you want to run, and you've got your actor. You're away. There's nothing more to it to, than that. So it's really, really simple, but it's kind of hard to get your head around the syntax. Well, I found it hard at first anyway. So what's a strategy? So the strategy is the first thing in that slide I showed you just before. So it's basically a, a way of evaluating that expression that you give it, so that effect that we saw before. It's how do you evaluate that expression? So the default one that I tend to use is the executor strategy, and it defaults to an executor service, which is a java.util.concurrent class, which basically means it's a thread pool, and then you can configure how the thread pool runs. So you can give it 100 threads or five threads or whatever, and basically those threads are sitting around there waiting, you can configure how that thread pool behaves, does it spawn off new threads, does it keep that number, you know, all that kind of stuff's under the hood. So the executor just basically shells off the actor execution to the thread pool. So you give it an effect, to work on and then it goes and runs it on in that executor service and it does all the, the Scala Z implementation does all the work of creating that stuff for you. The next one is a naive strategy. So basically each time you send a message to an actor, it starts up and it runs and it goes and it does its work. So that's pretty naive. It'll soon exhaust probably the, the limits of your system. Um, the next one is a sequential actor and that just evaluates each one in succession. So this is just no concurrency, it just sticks it on a queue and you just run it as you, as you use it. People who do GUI programming might be used to like a run loop or what's it called, a worker thread or something like that. So it's, you could kind of think about it like that. Um, identity just does nothing. <laughs> Question? Uh, the sequential strategy, um, is it still asynchronous? It'd be an asynchronous handoff. So it's probably sp spun up one thread and it asynchronously hands off to that thread and then you keep going and doing your thing, but it doesn't block. Let's answer that for sure, hey? <coughs> Sequential. In the current thread, there you go. Sorry, no, it evaluates it in the current thread. So I stole that offer in his slides who wrote this code. So it's very interesting. <coughs> this is the, yeah, I won't take you through that. Okay, or you can roll your own. There's an example that I found on, I think it was on Stack Overflow, that had someone written um, an actor that ran on the swing. What's it called? The, um, I just mentioned it. The thing that you do GUI stuff on in Swing, in Java Swing. So, in. Sorry. The EG. What's that? That's the, the event is matching through, which is oh. moving through. Yeah. What? Yeah. So, yeah. So, it runs it on the thing that you can update your GUI with. I do Cocoa programming, it's called the, run, the main run loop. So, it's a similar thing, it's just the thing that's spinning, getting GUI events. Um, so, yeah, someone wrote some sample code to do that. So, you can roll your own, they're very easy to roll, they're not very hard. I mean, you saw, you saw that code. That's it. So you're saying you get to lock your UI at the same time? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Immutable. Good. Immutable UI, yeah. Ah, oh, it's not going to work. <laughs> so that's the strategy. So how do you run stuff? So the effect is actually the thing that you want to run. So it's the stuff that, that gets the work done. So it's the, the block of code that reacts to the messages and, and does stuff. So it, this is kind of the work. So you give it some type A. Um, and or an instance of that type, and then it does some work, and that's it. So it obeys those rules that we said earlier. So it 
only operates on the input it receives. That A is given to it in whatever order. So it could be the first A, it could be the third A that it's been given, so it doesn't really matter. It just takes that, that's all it can do. It doesn't work. That's it. So it's just basically a function that doesn't return anything. So the last thing is optional, and it's the error handler. So it's how do you handle errors if, if that function, um, this one, throws any, any exception. So everything in Scala is a runtime exception. So it, nothing is compile time um, catchable like it is in Java. So you, you can do stuff yourself if you want to, which I do do in this example. Um, so it's optional, the default just throws the exception. So if it gets something, it just rethrows it and it's done with it, it doesn't, it doesn't care. Um, so it's kind of a null, I suppose, it doesn't actually add anything. Um, this bottom example is something, AJ, that you might, might know from Erlang OTP. This is kind of how you might manage supervisor hierarchies using Scala Z actors. And this is just something that somebody whacked on a mailing list. It's not, no more baked than that. But basically what it's saying is that given an error, you might ask some supervisor. And that bang is special. That's the thing that, that lets you give um, some data to an actor. So this is the data over here, this tuple. So we've so the A in this example is a tuple, a tuple two, so it's got two things in it. And we're giving it to this actor to do the work. So we haven't defined what supervisor is, but pretend it's the supervisor that's monitoring all these actors. Then basically if there's an error, just shunt it up. You know, shunt up the actor that produced the error and the error itself up to the up to the supervisor and let it deal with it. And yeah. So none of this stuff is baked into Scala Z. It's very, very simple. And somebody was, I think, bemoaning that fact that it was too simple and saying, I wish somebody had write something like this. Okay, so to create an actor, so I kind of I've told you the bits of an actor, but this is how to actually hook it all together and create an actor. So there's there's two functions. Um, one, so this is the first instance. One takes the error um, that I showed you before, and the the block of work, so the effect to do the work, and creates the actor and returns you an actor that you, then you can then shove messages on. So here's an actor that's been created earlier. Um, the second method has the default implementation of this error handler, and it just takes something and does something with it, and that's it. So it's really, really easy. So, any questions before I jump into an example? When you say supervisor, does that work in the true supervisor then? You write it, AJ, and it will. Okay. So this doesn't so exist. No. So no. no. <laughs> there is no supervisor. No, no. This, this code exists in a mailing list post somewhere, which I went, that looks really cool. So I copied it. <laughs> no, no, nobody's written it. Somebody was just saying, I wish Scala Z actors had supervisor hierarchies. And this is one way you could implement that. Acker actors do. Acker is the way to go if you want the super complicated, explode your brain, 4,000 actors in your application. Yeah, Acker is very heavily, from what I understand of it, modeled on Erlang and Erlang OTP. So if you want to go that way, you can. The guy that wrote it seems pretty cluey about that sort of stuff. So, But I don't know a lot about it. So here's my little example, and this is pulled from an app that I wrote um, that sends push notifications to these phones. Um, so it's working, it's running in production, and it's been, I don't know how long it's been up for, probably four months, and it just hums along in the background and there's never any issues with it. Um, <clears throat> so I pulled that code out and somebody said, wouldn't it be good if you could compare Scala actor implementations? So I started to create that project that does that. So this is kind of real world in that it does stuff that we use in my company every day. Well, we don't use it every day, it just hums along in the background every day. Um, and I've just pulled out the commonalities and pulled out all the, the interesting bits to us as a company that we don't want to open source and open source the, the project. So this is it here and I'll show you the code, it's up on GitHub. Um, but basically all it's doing is you've got some client over here that makes a socket connection to this. So this is the server part over here. Makes a socket connection to this listener and all it does is every connection it's, it sees, it just grabs the socket and throws it onto an actor and then waits for another socket. And that's all it does. It's just a while that just spins. Um, so then it throws it onto a receiver and that receiver basically does some processing. So it basically parses the payload that it gets given. So it's a JSON payload that this thing gets given. Parses the payload and then when it's finished, it, the thing that does the parsing generates a response. 
and that socket and that response is thrown onto this. And I already pulled it apart just to make it a bit more complicated. Sorry if you um, covered this already. But I have, Ija. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'm not sorry. Um, do the, each one of those maps or each actor map to an OX thread or a green thread? Could be whatever you want. It's how you define the strategy that executes right. that function. Okay. <clears throat> so there's. So, so naive would be thread bound. Yeah, naive runs executor on the would be runs on the main right thread. Right. Sorry. Executor would be event bound, and naive would be thread bound. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can on this little machine here. You can rapidly exhaust it. I'll show you a test in a minute that runs, I think, a hundred thousand requests across a uh, hundred concurrent clients, and it. It doesn't exhaust it, but you can pretty easily ramp it up and start hitting the limits of the machine, um, which is easily fixed. You know, I could increase the number of open files, which is what it starts hitting. So, I've done no tuning whatsoever to the JVM or the number of open files or anything like that in this stuff. It works well enough for our case. Um, we actually overload the machine too much. We can handle a lot more of the actual app itself, but it overloads the hardware. And the hardware's crap, but. Um, <clears throat> so, once this thing gets its socket and a response, it sends a response back to the client. So that's that's it, there's nothing more to it than that. So, let's jump into this. Okay, so I'll just take you through the code really, really quickly, because we're running short of time. Um, so this is just the thing that starts stuff up. It's not very exciting, so I'm not gonna run you through it very quickly. So can everyone read that code? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically it just starts up from the command line. It has a shutdown hook, which basically in Java parlance means that when you kill it, like you send it a signal to, to hold or you control C it, it will die gracefully. So when it gets that signal, it just calls this, or you can stop it manually if you want. So it just starts starts this socket listener listening. So this is it up here. It's my socket listener, it listens on a port and it has a queue. So this is a receive queue length on the server socket. So how many how many connections does the server socket queue up before it starts rejecting connections that connect to it? And I don't know what I've got it configured to, a thousand. So it'll accept a thousand connections. So that's just its busy queue while stuff in the background is doing work. So again, there's all these parameters we could tune to make stuff go faster. I haven't done any of that. A thousand seemed like a good number, doesn't seem to overload the machine, seems to work pretty fast. So basically when we start running, we bootstrap this socket listener up. Elix. Is that how you write your iPhone going to What? Just sort of thousands like a good number. <laughs> yes. Thousands yeah. is a good number. You can't hold that. Apple mandate. <laughs> 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 um, Port a thousand cubic. Yep. There you go. <clears throat> port. port whatever. Q like. So this is, just, this is just Java code, creates a new server socket, and then starts it listening. So here it is, just doing a busy wait on that socket. So here's the actual code that's of any, any kind of value here. So this is the first time we see an actor. Oops. Get rid of that. <clears throat> Ignore that comment, that's about me throwing in other implementations of different actors. We've only got Scala's in here. Right? So basically we have this service socket and we call accept, which basically is a blocking call on that thread. So this thread will block, waiting on a service socket connection. When it gets that connection, you've got a socket. So this, this method will return and then you shut into that actor. And then this method's finished, we go back into the busy mode and we just keep, keep looping, accepting connections. So this, this method here is important, this bang. So this is the one that lets you enqueue some work to be done on the actor. So you can see, this is the whole class, the whole Scala Z actor class, so it's pretty small. So yeah, if we've got a mailbox, offer it some work, otherwise convert it to an effect and offer it some work. So there's not much at all in Scala Z actor. So this is sending, shit, sorry. This is sending an actor a message, and the first message is that socket. So jump back here. So we just accepted a connection and we throw the socket onto that receiver and it's going to do some work. So let's go have a look at what this actor does. Okay, 
So here's our the troubles with my trackpad on this machine. So here's here's our actor here. That's it. So we've defined an actor. I've just given it a name to kind of make it somehow meaningful. And so here's that actor method that, that I showed you earlier. And we just give it a function or an effect here to execute the function that returns a unit from this goal. So it takes a socket. So that's the thing that we pull off the accept method. And it does some stuff with that socket. So <clears throat> this receive actor core stuff is me trying to abstract out the actors from the actual work. The work is kind of irrelevant, but I wanted to make it do something. Um, so basically, I'll show you quickly in a second, but it basically takes that socket, pulls bytes off it, which is JSON, parses that JSON, and returns something in here, which is actually a, um, a map of how it is, like description equals you know, successfully completed or something. Um, so given that response, we basically assemble it. So we've got a triple here. So we've got the socket. So underscore one is the first element of this, and underscore two is the second. So it actually generates a UDID. In order to kind of monitor what these threads are doing, we generate a UUID, sorry. So we can track what a session is, a client session. So the first time it gets a connection, it spins up a UUID. And so then we can track in the logs if the logs are interleaved across multiple threads, as they will do just so you can grep out the, the connection if you're interested in seeing what a particular session did. Um, so this is a UDID, UUID, sorry, and this is all typed, even though there's no types here. And this thing here will be the actual response, the actual, what, what this thing returned that we're interested in. So create a triple and send that triple to the actor. And here's the types here. So S is a socket, this is a UUID and response is the thing we're interested in, which is a type diff, I think. Yeah. So it's a, a map from symbol to string. That's not very exciting. So this is our second actor here. So basically, the first actor receives it, parses the socket, um, parses the socket data, sorry, does some work, returns a response, and then the response gets sent to the second actor, which is our sender actor that communicates to the client. Mm. That's it. So again, it's you know partially abstracted into this thing here. So we send that tuple to this. Just let me inline that. So we send that tuple to this actor. So here's the here's the tuple. So this is the function that does the work. And all it does is it calls this core on that tuple. So I'll just show you what that code does quickly. It's kind of irrelevant to the actor itself, but. So this is the receive, so this is the actual work that goes on. <clears throat> Got some logging. Generates a UUID for this particular session. Um, returns it when they're done. So this is a tuple that comes back from the first actor. Um, slopes, the payload, slopes the socket data in. Uh, does some logging. So it parses the, the payload here. So this is the JSON parser here. Gets back a response. Says it's finished and returns you a tuple. So that's that's really it. And you can see I didn't use Scala Z's built-in error handling function. I just wrapped it in a try catch so I could log it out. The reason I wrote this code was that the notification sender we had was really really hard to track what it was doing, and it would just lose connections, and you wouldn't know what it was doing. So this is trying to capture every possible error condition that was going on, and track that what that was, and that's why you generate a UUID so you can track that incoming connection back to the thing that sent the notification. I'm addicted to this UDID though. Hey, you're a man too. Oh, it's because of UDID oh, as a it's device identifier, yeah, and we use them like every bloody day, and I say it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, Damon. <laughs> <laughs> You wonder why we get no speakers, don't you? <laughs> 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 okay. All right, only about three minutes. Okay. Uh, you don't want to see the UID generator. Um, so then the sending actor. So again, it, it's pretty simple too. It takes a, takes a triple. So I give it a socket and a UUID and a response, which is the actual thing that we're interested in. 
um, it pulls the UID out. The reason it needs to be implicit is because these logging functions require an implicit U. I've done it again. <laughs> implicit U UID, um, which basically means there needs to be one in scope, so those things can function, which means that they log out that. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So there's the implicit U. It just logs it out at the start of a message, just so you have some context in each each log message. That's it. Writes. So it pulls off. The thing that we're interested in, which is the third element of that tuple, pulls that off, turns it into a JSON string and sends it back down the socket, closes the socket, we're done. That's it. So there's not, not much at all in there. The main, whoops, the main work, you know, that's kind of important to this, this talk is um, this line here. That line there that accepts the socket, throws it into the actor. The actor itself, it's really, really simple. So just you just throw a function into this actor method, does some stuff. Once you've got that message, just pass it on to another actor. So I haven't talked at all about what's backing these or what they're doing. We just know that we want to do some work. So I'll talk quickly about that stuff. Um, this is the executor strategy that, that I've used, and it's um, configured with an implicit thread pool. So it basically runs on a pool of threads. I don't know how many I've given it. It's a new fixed thread pool of 50. So it runs on 50 threads. Um, and basically it'll just, this executor strategy will take care of in queuing that work and actually running that function that we've passed in. So this is the function that we've passed in, actually running that function on, a, on an actual thread. So they, the strategy takes care of that. So you can see there's not much, not much at all to it. Just submit something to the executor service. That's that's really it. This is all just Java. This new callable is the thing that Java needs to run in a in an executor service. Don't know what else I can tell you. That's that's the configuration. Yep. So let's run it up. Let's see it running. Let's do that. That'll be interesting. See if it still compiles now, Ben. So let's run it up. So let's run the core over here. So let's just get a shell up with. Okay, so it's running. So it's just a log file. It'll probably run it quicker if we don't log it, but it's going to run really slow if we're telling that log. So you're not going to see anything in this window, so it's not very important. So let's run the load test. I'll show the load test quickly. Again, not very exciting. Um, so this is the message that it sends it. It's just a really simple bit of JSON. Um, and it spins up 10,000 requests across 100 threads. So again, this is another, th it's running on the same machine, so it's Gonna tax the machine pretty quickly. So let's run run that. Uh, we're already getting errors. So that's it running. So we'll just let that run and it'll probably take about 10, 15 seconds. Ah, there we go. So what did it do? 800 requests a second. So now that the JVM's a bit warm, let's run it again. So that's about as fast as I've got it on this machine, about 1,100 requests a second. I'll just run it a third time for kicks. 
I shall kill that low farm. Do you find you usually get more socket exceptions on the first run before it's warm? No, I usually get more light on it. Oh, okay. I don't know why. Let's just kill that. I don't think that would have been taken up any time. Let's just kill it anyway. Now it seems, I don't know why it's getting those, those first couple, but it only seems to get about that many. Oh, there you go. 2200, not logging. Let's run it again just to make sure that wasn't a fluke. I've never seen it go that fast. <laughs> You're in demo mode it's going that fast, that's just not right. I've just turned on the fake logging. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> just generates a number between one and two. Hey? You're not actually running the JVM at all. No. <laughs> there you go, 1800. So 2200 is pretty good. That's faster than I've seen it run before. I've probably, what have I got running? All sorts of shit. If you spell good, right? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, it. The, that's yeah. the benefit. Of that. <laughs> okay, so, so it seems pretty fast to me, but I've been doing a lot of Rails work lately, and it's like two requests a second. So it's <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, SBT can be slow. Um, so, just some random notes about Scala Z actors. They're pretty lightweight, like there's not much to them, there's just that little bit there. Um, there's no remote support, so you can't run a function on a remote machine. But that's not to say you couldn't build it, build an actor that runs it on a remote machine, that'd be pretty easy to do using, I don't know, what's it called? The, the remote method invocation. God, that's all RMI. Or something even better, if you want to. <laughs> shows you my age. Yeah, I looked at you before, because I know we've done it before. Um, there's no supervisor hierarchies. Um, and I haven't talked about the rest of Scala Z actor stuff, which is actually much, much more interesting, but um, I didn't get into that for this stuff. And it would be, I think that'd be a lot, there's a lot in there. And if you look at Runa's talk, which I talk about at the end, um, he's got about 15 slides on that. Okay, so just some food for thought. This is something Nick found today that I thought was really, really interesting. So Snap is what a Haskell web framework. So without logging, so we did what, 2200 requests per second? Snap is serving what, 35,000 roughly requests per second? And we're down here. So we're not as fast as Apache, but we're faster than Ruby, so I think. <laughs> so, you know, it's completely... <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, just it's very relevant, Nick, come on. <laughs> So anyway, this stuff, go look at Scala Z, hassle Nick, because he writes more code than I do. Um, this is Rooney's talk, it's very, very good. Um, go look on Stack Overflow for Scala Z, take questions, there's stuff on there. This is that project I showed you called Corral, it's the actor shootout, very funny. Um, Scala Actors, uh, this is the default Scala Actors tutorial off the, um, the EPFL site, if you want to learn how to do real Scala Actors using Scala uh, standard libraries. That's it. Any questions? Yeah, uh, just a comment on the uh, data actors at two low level. To me, working in day to day, they're not kind of the building block for concurrency in apps, and that the promised stuff that he's done on top of that is is much more advanced and yeah, should be so. And it's composable. Are they applicable functions, Nick? Yeah. I don't so you can kind of do really really interesting stuff with them, but yeah. I didn't want to get into that, so I didn't. Okay. Right. The bank operator. Does it hide away a copy of the original actor as an initial parameter or something like that? No, it's a, it's a, it's a member of this class. It's an instance method. You mean for sort of replacement? Oh no, it doesn't doesn't, doesn't handle replacement. You, you can build that. You, you can build that on top. Yeah. So that's what I mean. It's very simple. There's nothing nothing exciting about it. You build reply by sending the actor you want to reply to in the yeah, in the message. Yeah, and you can hide that away. Yeah, 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 probably. They're still on the thread, Michael. <laughs> I was kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're standing your iPhone asses, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kid. <Yeah. laughs> um, anyone else before I let Brian up front? No. Alright, thanks, guys.